Major funding for these programs has been provided by grants from Chase Commercial Term Lending and m and Bank, Geneva Burns, Jean Tomasi and Webster, Capital One Bank, the Wickoff Group, New York Community Bank, Greenberg Trorug, Perfect Building Maintenance, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company. Additional funding is provided by grants from Aerial Property Advisors, AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CVRE, Colliers International NYC, Cushman and Wakefield, Customers Bank, CUNY TV Foundation, DDG, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, First Nationwide Title Insurance Agency, Flushing Bank, Friedman, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, Herrick Feinstein, Versha Hospitality Trust, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Chairman, USRealty.com, John Katsimides, Red Apple Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, New Banks, Newmark Grubnight Frank, People's United Bank, RBS Citizens Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling & Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Continuum Company, Urban American, and these friends. So how does somebody growing up in Chicago, Illinois, then going to Ann Arbor, Michigan, then returning to Chicago, ending up in Minnesota at the Pillsbury Company, the Pillsbury Doughboy, Burger King, then coming to New York City, getting involved with Revlon, Sunbeam, other companies, and major Jewish philanthropy. Very interesting. Today, I'm lucky to have Jerry Levin, who is the chairman and CEO of JW Levin and Partners and also the executive chairman of Wilton Brands. Thanks for being here. Thank you for inviting me. So tell me about your grandparents, because you said they were part of Russia. They came from Russia or Poland. I wasn't sure. Uh, they came from Belarus, I'm told, and I'm told it was Russia. It was Poland, uh, but uh, the chief rabbi of the Ukraine claims me. He said, no, all my... He's taking credit. Okay. Now, how'd they end up in Chicago? Well, they all came from the same area. In uh, Mogilev, Podolsky, I probably pronounced that slightly wrong. And I think that's the way people immigrated. You knew somebody in a community, and your friends came, and relatives came, and they all wound up in the west side of Chicago. And they were in the scrap business? My grandfather, on my father's side, was in the scrap business, though by the time I got to know him, he, uh, they were all retired. And what about your mother's side? What about her parents? He was a furrier and an actor. An actor? He was on the Hungarian stage in Chicago. He used to do a lot of performances there, and his whole life was a stage. He, a lot of flourish, a lot of excitement, very dramatic man, wonderful man. Your father grew up in Chicago. He got involved with the insurance business, right? Right. And how did he meet your mother? I don't know. <laughs> I thought you asked me about that, and I. I, I you better I, check I, because she's okay. still around in Florida <laughs> at ninety-four. So now the interesting thing is, your father gets um, drafted, and what happens? in Europe about his planes, the three planes that went down? Well, he went into uh, the Army Air Force early, and he was trained to be a pilot. And my understanding of the story is he actually lost three airplanes in the European theater, and they shipped him back to the United States. To, to Fort St. Houston, right? Fort, 
Courts in Houston, in San Antonio, Texas, to be a teacher. If you can't do it, you know, you could teach it. Right. He was supposed to be teaching. So he and a couple of other of his associates were given the responsibility of teaching uh, a group of Chiang Kai-shek soldiers how to fly airplanes. When your mother moves down there, you're born. I was born on the base, and uh, I know I've seen pictures of the Chinese Air Force surrounding this man and woman, my parents with a little baby in their hands, that was me. So now your father and mother with a little baby move back to Chicago. Correct. And you told me that Chicago at that time was like, it was different ethnics in different places, right? Tell me about that. Uh, our, our neighbor, it was Austin, was basically Catholic. It was Polish Catholics, Greek Catholics, Catholics, Italian Catholics, and a few Jews. Uh, it had been Jewish many years before, but we were among the last of the Jews in the neighborhood to move out. Now, you said to me your father went into, uh, it must have been your grandfather who was involved with Mutual of, uh, Mutual of Omaha. My grandfather had a Mutual of Omaha franchise for the Chicago area. Many decades ago, uh, they, Mutual of Omaha, had bought out all these franchises and gone to a different system. And uh, my understanding is my grandfather was so difficult to deal with, they left it with him as opposed to trying to buy him out. And he was allowed to take it down one generation to my father. And then when my father retired, it went back to the company. And, and you said to me, you know, you were not the best student. You, you had a good aptitude, but you really didn't do well when you were growing up in school. You, you delivered meat to the kosher butcher. You worked part-time in the insurance office. You did other things. And when you're in high school, you really didn't have any idea that you even wanted to go to college, right? I, I wasn't sure. It wasn't important. My parents had not gone to college. Many of my friends were not going to college. It just wasn't the culture to, to so, think about. So this. what happens one day with the gym teacher? Oh. Well, uh, I did take the college test. SAT, I think it's called, and I, I did well. I was good at taking tests, and uh, there was a requirement in the Chicago public school system that graduating high school seniors had to take an hour of college counseling, and we didn't have a college counselor at our high school. The gym teacher was doing that, and I went in for my hour, and I was leaning towards going to school, but that meant going to the University of Illinois Circle Campus in downtown Chicago, or Roosevelt, uh, there was no thought about going to uh, a large school somewhere uh, away. And he looked at my test scores, and he said, gee, you're, you have very high test scores. You could probably get into a good college if you wanted to. I said, well, okay. And uh, he didn't know much about what was going on in the college world. But he reached over and said, I just got a brochure from the University of Michigan this morning. That's supposed to be a good school. Why don't you look at that one? So I said, yeah, sounds okay to me. I didn't know anything about college. And I went home that night <coughs> and asked my parents if I could go away to college. And they looked at each other and said, well, you know, we'll try and find a way. If, you know, we could support you, we will. And they said, but you had a cousin who went to Michigan also? I brought up the University of Michigan. And I said, you have a cousin who's at the University of Michigan now. So uh, we got his telephone number in Michigan from my uncle, called him, George. And uh, George, this is your uncle Bucky, where my father went, and, and Jerry. Uh, you're at the University of Michigan now? He said, yeah. Uh, well, Jerry's thinking of going there. Is it a good school? And he said, oh, yeah, it's a great school. I didn't have any more questions. That was the end of it. So I decided I would go to the University of Michigan. You didn't even know if you'd get in. You, because your academic grades in school weren't good, but you had high test scores, but you went for engineering. Why engineering? I mean, you're a mergers and acquisition specialist. How did engineering come into this? Well, it wasn't that I was worried about getting in. I didn't know I wouldn't get in. I didn't understand there was a process. If this guy, this gym teacher said, I should go to the University of Michigan, I thought, okay, I'll go. That's the end of it. Uh, but I went back to him the next day and I said, all right, I'll, I'll go to the University of Michigan. He said, all right, uh, good. What college do you want to go to? And I said, I just told you, the University of Michigan. He said, no, 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 what college? I said, I don't know what you're talking about. 
He said, well, there's the university and then there's colleges where you go to liberal arts or you go to engineering or you know, uh, whatever the others were. And I said, well, I never thought about that. He said, well, you have a very high score in math. Maybe you should consider going into engineering. So I said, okay, if you say so. I, I didn't actually know what an engineer did. And I went home that night and I told my parents that, okay, I'm going to go to the University of Michigan and I'm going to be an engineer. I'm going to the engineering school. And my father said, you can't, which is not the right thing to say to me. I was really an obnoxious kid. And uh, I said, what do you mean I can't? He said, because engineering is a restricted profession. They don't hire Jews, which was true, I, I learned later. And I said, naturally, I've always wanted to be an engineer. You can't stop me, which gives some insight as to my personality as a young person. And I did. I applied. I got in. Uh, and you never <coughs> even went there. You, when, you, when you started Michigan, that was the first day. You didn't take the campus. Uh, you, just, the, you applied, you got accepted, I, and you I ended up. that? They told me to be there on a Monday. Yeah, okay, I went there on a Monday. I was like from outer space there with my leather jacket and my ducktail and my engineering boots. That at least matched engineering. That was cool for the so-called hoods, you know, back then. So well, when you went to Michigan, this was a five-year engineering program. It was actually four years, and I decided to take an extra year to get a second degree. Right, so you had an de extra degree, and um, you, you, were, uh, you were a good test taker, but once again, you really didn't work too hard, you said. You graduated with a 2.0 average. It, absolutely, whatever I needed to do to pass, and that wasn't much. Right. And during the summers, one time you worked with Zenith Radio? Worked for a couple summers with Zenith Radio. And I had to work. I always right. had to work. I had to work when I was at Michigan. So what did you do in Michigan? What kind of jobs? Uh, my principal occupation in Michigan was a bookie. I Basketball or just the, I, the horses? Anything that Michigan played in because I learned quickly that the kids from Michigan always bet on Michigan. They didn't know from a point spread or odds. They, they were betting on Michigan. So if it was three to one on something, I'd give them two to one. It was, it was easy money, and I, I did that for a long time. It actually kept me in school until I, I made a big bet once. I bet uh, that Sonny Liston was going to decimate uh, Cassius Clay, you know, then Muhammad. But that was in Michigan. That was you, you, you increased your exposures. It had, I, gr I grew my business a little bit, and uh, I actually drove to Indiana to watch Sonny Liston work out. I said, there's no chance the skinny little kid is going to beat him. And it was, I don't know if you remember, it was like 12 to 1 in favor of Sonny Liston going into that fight. So I was giving everyone on campus 5 to 1, 6 to 1, whatever it took. Then, of course, when I lost, I lost everything I had. I didn't have money to pay my tuition. I didn't have money for my books. I uh, I was renting out my motor scooter. I was fixing up guys on dates, $5 Friday night, $10 Saturday night. And I had to, the most degrading experience I had was take a meal job. I took a meal job in a fraternity. That was the low point of my career, I'd so say. So you, you, you had to serve? I'm serving these fraternity guys at the <laughs> Animal House. They're throwing food at me, but I had to eat. Okay, you graduate from Michigan, and as, uh, as I said, and as many of my friends, there was two alternatives. You join the Army Reserve or you try to get a deferment. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you go back to Chicago because you had met your wife, Carol, earlier. And you go back to Chicago and, and you work for a company called Square D, right? right. And what, you, what happened at Square D? I learned what an engineer really does, and it wasn't for me. So then you said, okay, I still don't want to go into the Army, so you... you you went full-time for your graduate degree. Yes, I, I stayed in school. I, went to, I had applied to the University of Chicago to go nights. That was my plan. And I called them up and said, is there any chance I could get in the day program? And, and they did. They took me in, for, uh, in the business school. So you finished the business school, and there are two different type of occupations which will also keep you away from going to Vietnam. One was you could work with McNamara, in the White House, but at that one you were a member of the military, which would be too close to maybe getting on a plane. Or you could work for a defense-based type of company. So now you end up in Houston, another city called Texas Instruments, right? In Dallas. In Dallas. Dallas. Yeah. 
So tell me about, because that's a very interesting thing because that helped propel your career. You're working at, uh, at TI and the, the patent infringement of the case? Well, um, I got to TI as a business analyst and the semiconductor industry was a very cyclical industry at that time. They'd hired about four or five of us to create a department of young guys who all came from top business schools. And uh, I was there for a few months and they, in a layoff mode, uh, eliminated our jobs. <coughs> and they said, don't worry, we brought you down here, we're gonna give you another job. And we all waited and about a month later, each one of us was called in and offered a job in another part of the company. I was offered a job in procurement. And uh, every, the other four or five took, took whatever they were offered and I said, I did not come down to Dallas to, to go into procurement. It's of no interest to me. So I turned the job down. And everyone thought that was a terrible move. I was gonna destroy my career, you know, the move, leaving the company at that point. But uh, Texas Instruments was great. They said, okay, and they made up another job for me. And I was uh, really an analyst to one of the group vice presidents. It was undefined. I was just, whatever projects he had, I would, I would help him out with. I actually had some very interesting projects. And then, you know, uh, luck and timing are very important to career building. Uh, he gave me an assignment which, uh, it was a project that was a result of a, an agreement between the CEO of Texas Instruments and another company. Texas Instruments had violated a patent. There was a lot of money involved. But the two CEOs cleverly figured out that we could both win if you agree that you'll buy $50 million of products with us over the, from us in the next five years. And they signed the deal, and I was given the job of managing that project to make sure we bought the $50 million. Unfortunately, their specs were different than our specs, and the chances of doing that were almost zero. And uh, there was a, I had a counterpart who was doing it for the other company, and we'd meet and we'd talk, and we were very frustrated, and we figured out a couple hundred thousand dollars of stuff, but you know, this was hopeless. Uh, one day, it was his turn to come to Dallas. I'd been going to his facility every other time. And I picked him up at the airport, I was gonna take him to dinner, and then we'd start in the morning. When he got off the airplane, uh, he was literally dirty. He was black. His hands were covered with soot. And he looked terrible. So we went to dinner, had a few drinks. And I said, you know, you really don't look so good. What's going on? He said, oh, it's terrible. Our plant, uh, the, the, it actually produced graphite type products, is on strike. We can't, it, it's a critical plant for us. So I have been, I and the rest of his management group have been working the machines. He was down there on the factory floor uh, producing things. I said, oh, that's terrible. So I dropped him off at his hotel. I went, I, I, I went home for a minute, thought about it. Then I went to the office at about midnight or one o'clock in the morning. And I produced a purchase order for $50 million worth of goods from that factory. Which he knew they couldn't produce. Couldn't, there was no way they were right. gonna produce it. So, so you, you, got, you got seen by management in a, in a much better light. You produce. They, they actually finally agreed to execute the order. It took a little, you know, it took the CEO, it took you know, the, some of the directors, lawyers, inside, outside counsel, and everyone agreed we should try this. And it led to a settlement that cost almost nothing to the company. So I was a young kid. Right. And they said, oh, you know. This you did a nice I job. <laughs> then you and Carol wanted to move back t to Chicago because the grandparents were getting older. So you moved to Chicago and you get a company with this legendary company called Marshall McClellan. And um, you're there and then they decide one day they're going to move from Chicago to New York. And you really had two opportunities. You had the opportunity at, at Marsh and Continental Bank and they kept the opportunity because of the relationship that Marsh over there and you were working at this time really buying some insurance brokerage firms and doing Well, that. it started, they, uh, the, the board of Marsh McLennan uh, actually stepped in and uh, fired the chairman, CEO, and the CFO. CFO was my boss, I was the treasurer of the company, and moved it to New York, and it really went back to their roots, which was the insurance business. They had been diversifying. It was a, 
Absolutely right. So right. one day after two years, you get a phone call from the uh, from Pillsbury uh, in Minneapolis. And what happens? Tell me about that, because that's really your career route that made you get involved with the mergers and acquisitions. I, <clears throat> I had been working with Marsh Mack for that two-year period, buying insurance agencies. That's what we did, but, well, like one a month. But it, you know, I, I learned a little bit about mergers and acquisitions. And um, I got this call. Uh, my secretary said, this gentleman wants to come see me from Pillsbury. I thought it was about buying insurance from us. And boy, I could be a real hero if I could bring in the Pillsbury account. So I, I agreed to meet with him, came to my office, walked in, said, could I close the door? I thought that was a little strange, but okay. And uh, he wanted to talk to me about moving to Minneapolis. To uh, They had a new CEO who wanted to get involved in mergers and acquisitions, wanted to start building the company that way. And they'd heard about me <coughs> and wanted to know if I would be interested in inter interviewing for the job. So you felt that since Chicago is so warm, you could go even colder to go to Minneapolis. I don't think I thought about the weather that much. I didn't realize what I was getting. Right. It, is, it is a cold place, Minneapolis. So, so you're in Minneapolis, and nobody, you know, people don't realize that Pillsbury had a, a popularity of a variety of companies. They own haagen They own Steak and Ale. Uh, they own Burger King. Um, how many companies were you, were you buying, selling, working on, operating during this period of your 15 years? At well, we didn't have much capital. I mean, a low price earnings ratio. So the deal was every time I bought something, I had to sell something to raise the capital. And we, we were upgrading the company in the process. And uh, one of the fellows who worked for me decided to go count them. And he said, we've done 400 tran merger acquisition divestiture transactions over was about a 10 year period. So it was busy. We had our own little investment bank that just did restaurants, agricultural products, food, food products. And uh, we took the company from about, the, the core was about $500 million that we didn't sell. And we took it up to, it was about $6 billion in total at the end when we were approached and yeah. sold it to somebody else. Right. And then Grand Met comes in right. and they, they want to buy the company. And one of the interesting things that you did was uh, one of the, the items was Burger King, which was owned by Pillsbury. And uh, you were able to successfully uh, create additional value saying that, it's going to be in Florida, a separate thing, and then they, they paid an extra half a billion dollars for Pillsbury. So how do you get from Pittsburgh, now, uh, from uh, Minnesota, to New York City? Well, uh, it really has to do with our law firm uh, for mergers and acquisitions, Skadden Arps, out of New York, was representing us on most of our major transactions. And I was buying a company called Diversa Foods, which was the, actually the largest uh, franchisee of Burger King and also owned Chart House and some other restaurant properties, including Godfather's Pizza. Uh, and uh, there was, Skadden Arps was also working at the same time on a deal of a Mr. Ronald Perlman buying Revlon. And when you're a principal in transactions, the lawyers are doing all the work. You sit around, you got nothing to do. And here, Ronald and I were sitting in Skadden Arps' office. We were the same attorneys. We were running back and forth. We got to know each other. And uh, he did successfully buy Revlon. And then later, uh, he tried to buy Gillette. And they called me and asked me if he's able to buy Gillette, would I go to Gillette and be the chairman of Gillette? So I said, yeah, I, I would do that. But he never bought it. It was a long, extended thing. And about we knew each other, and we'd always talked about working together. Uh, after we sold uh, Pillsbury to Grand Met, uh, he came across the Coleman Company, and they called and said, do you want to work with us on you know, trying to buy the Coleman Company, and then you'll become chairman if we do it? And that's what happened. So you go Coleman, and then that's Ron's company. Then, then after running Coleman successfully, you go over to Revlon, who was, as we would say, in the dead, not really doing that well. There were, there were some issues, and uh, Ronald asked me to move to New York to uh, become the CEO of Revlon. To, and take care of that. And uh, that, that was the big life-changing event. Uh, we'd never really wanted to go to New York, but uh, we did, and it's been great. After Revlon comes, what's th what comes next? Back to Coleman? Yeah. Uh, Revlon became, went from you know, the bottom of the industry to the top of the industry. We were doing great. And Coleman, which we had fixed, got itself in trouble again. We didn't quite know what to do. 
It wasn't my idea, but I, agree, I agreed to go along with it. But uh, everyone thought, well, why don't you stay as chairman of Revlon, but you'll also be chairman and CEO of Coleman, and uh, you'll do both. And uh, that, the doing both was too complicated. You just couldn't do it all. And so I had to focus on Coleman. And uh, we did, and we were pretty well along on turning Coleman back around when uh, Al Dunlop of Sunbeam showed up and wanted to buy Coleman from right, us. Right, and then you eventually back. sold to him. So you and, you and Carol married how many years? Uh, it's 47. And you have how many children? A, we have a son, Joshua, and a daughter, Abby. And Joshua is married to who? Uh, Joshua's married to Lauren, and yeah. Abby's married to Steve Brody. Right, and you have grandchildren? They each have two. Uh, we have Spencer, who's 15, uh, Layla, who's 6, and that's Joshua and Lauren's. And then Abby has Benno, who's two and a half, Benjamin, officially, and Jacob, who was just born a few months ago. Okay. Now, you said to me, when you were in Minnesota at Pillsbury, one day you realized that really it wasn't intentional, but they weren't really helping Jewish people take holidays off because you didn't have to worry. So you got involved with the Federation uh, over there, and you... And you're, over the years, your last r major role in New York Federa and the National Federation is what? I was president of UJ Federation until June of last year when I termed out. I'm glad I termed out. It, it's very hard to keep a full-time CEO job and be president of the Federation, uh, but I'm, it's one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. Uh, I'm delighted I did it, and I'm delighted I'm not doing it right now. Left it in great hands. And besides the Federation of, of UJA, you're also involved with the Federation organizations around the nation, right? I, I was, yes. I, I, I still am involved with, to a minor extent. But I, and, 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 and locally, you're involved with a number of other charities also. Yes. So, you know, for the kid who, who grew up being part of a gang, which I still can't believe, but, you know, you had your boots on, okay? who then really said, I, you know, because you're, you were even a benefactor of University of Michigan uh, in the engineering school. And as you said, when they came, came back to you one day, they said, you really had a 2.0, okay? Well, they asked me to do the commencement address for the engineering school, and I said, that's not really appropriate. What would I say? I was a terrible student. You know, they came in my... And, uh, I said, no, you should do it. I said, look, I, I really think I was last in my class, and I, I just don't think it's right. And they called me the next day and said, well, we, we checked. And actually, you were not last in your class. You were last in both classes because I was in a double degree program. So, but I went, and uh, you know, I did it, and I, I enjoyed it, and I think So, so the kid it. Who, who grew up you know, working you know, in the butcher, delivering food for the kosher butcher and everything, has really uh, done a lot of good things for the community and for the business. And thanks for being here today. Thank you. Thank you for saying so.